everyone to our focus on education panel for impact 100 houston we're so excited you could all be here today i'm kristen lenore and i'm the member engagement chair here at impact 100 houston and we're so excited to bring this programming to you this is going to be um, the start of a series of panels that we will be focusing on our five focus areas to learn from nonprofits serving the Houston area in these uh, particular focus areas. And today we're really excited to learn more about education. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Aisha Crumbine, who's going to moderate our panel for us and let her introduce herself. So um, go ahead, Aisha. Awesome. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for one, uh, hosting this space and bringing women together to have conversation around education. Um, my name is Aisha Crumbine. I am a native Houstonian, um, as well as a lifelong educator. I started teaching in 1999 as a part of Teach for America here in Houston um, and have remained in education for what is almost 22 years. Wow. Um, and have done a little bit of everything along the way from being a teacher to being an administrator. Um, I have worked in public in public charter schools and private schools um, and now am both an educational consultant and do some fundraising work for Teach for America here in Houston. Um, and so over 20 years have had a really good lens into what education looks like both as a student as a teacher. Um, and as someone working in the nonprofit space. And education is a very, very nuanced um, sector. There's a lot that's at play. There are a lot of factors that influence the type of education our children have. Um, and there are a lot of brilliant, brilliant organizations led by remarkable women, just so happens to be that way, um, who are leading the charge to make our education system better. So the purpose of today's conversation is just to hear from some of those people to get a better understanding of what's happening in education, um, what our kids are experiencing in schools and what organizations around the city are doing to improve their experience, to deepen their learning and to make the overall system better for kids. So thank you for being a part of this conversation of, of jumping in and seeking to learn and get more information um, with the hopes that you will make a phenomenal decision when it comes time to decide where your dollars go and how you can make an impact in the system. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I wanna make sure that the people on the panel have an opportunity to introduce themselves, to share a little bit about who they are, what is the work they do, um, and what their role or how they came to be in education. Um, and then after everybody introduces themselves, we'll do a quick kind of orientation to how the panel will go and then we'll get started with a conversation. This is very much intended to be a conversation among friends. So imagine we're sitting outside in the backyard with a beverage of our choice in our hands and we're just talking about something that matters. Um, so I'm gonna invite Jackie, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, what you do in education, how you got here, and then you can pass it on to the next person. I'm Jackie Daughtry. I'm the executive director at Literacy Now. And like Aisha, I too am a native Houstonian, as is my husband. So I hear we're kind of rare, but we've got two of those in our family um, at our house. So um, I'm very excited to be here. But unlike Aisha, education was not my thing, not my background. Um, my background is in business and in small business management. And um, so I came to this space with, um, it's been almost 15 years ago when the um, founder, Jerry Davis, who founded, it was called Making It Better until about two years ago, we changed the name to Literacy Now, when Jerry um, came to me in, with his vision of starting an organization and asked if I would help him. And um, he knew my... Um, he knew where my talents were because I had been his lacrosse team mom for four years at our son's, at our kids' high school. And so my background in education comes from being a parent, being a PTO president, being very involved in um, HISD as far as not just my kids' schools, but also on some district-wide committees. And I just love school and I love children. And so, um, We've got other people at Literacy Now who have the background in the education part of education. Um, and then I'm really more like the business side, but of course have grown over the last almost 15 years to learn a lot about education and then 
always been very passionate about that, especially education when it comes to the inequities for low income children and uh, children of color and just really providing not the equal spot, but what they what's needed for each child. And so that's what we've been doing um, in the area of literacy and reading and early, we believe in intervening really early. And so our programs really start at preschool with a community-based program that's parent and child and then on school campuses um, with HISD. And I'll just tell y'all, y'all be the first ones to know it more than even some of our employees. We've just sealed a deal yesterday with all Dean ISD that we're going to be um, expanding our program next year into all Dean ISD. So we're really, really excited about it. So y'all are getting like the hot off the press news because this just happened yesterday afternoon. Um, so we're just, we're so excited about our expansion and being able to take really impactful programs um, to young children and to engage their parents because our bottom line goal is that kids will be reading on level by third grade. Awesome. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Selena, tell us a little bit about you. Ah, thanks. Um, hi, my name is Selena Diaz and I am a manager of district success uh, at Pro Unitas where we help uh, school districts easily identify students for non-academic support. We connect students to social health and human services. Um, but I wanted to share that I too am a proud Houstonian. Um, and I grew up here. Uh, I grew up in a single parent household. Um, growing up as a child, I did struggle with reading. So literacy, yes, is very important. Um, I struggled with reading in the early grades, but I overcame this and uh, now I'm a graduate of Teachers College Columbia University and I've spent the last decade as an elementary school teacher um, right here in Houston. So having experienced you know, many financial hardships growing up and teaching in impoverished communities, I understand how important it is to have those you know, basic and emotional needs met mm -hmm. so that one can really be ready and the right frame of mind to really receive that academic learning. Yes. So I, I think the, the fit at Pro Unitas is, is just perfect for me as I transitioned um, into this career. So uh, my experience is having lived it, going through public school here in Houston, um, as well as, as teaching it and now in the nonprofit uh, sector. So. That's a little bit about me. And lastly, I just want to say I am excited to be here today with you all. Awesome. All right, Courtney, you're up. OK, what a stellar group of women we get to have lunch with, right? This is pretty <laughs> exciting. Um, you know, I got to start out, I guess, by saying that I'm not a native Houstonian. <laughs> But I, but I will say, when I first moved to Houston, um, Aisha was one of the first people that I grabbed coffee with, and she kind of um, set a layout for me of what education was was like in Houston. And you know, I picked up my career. I moved here without knowing um, anybody in Houston besides the person that hired me. And I said, "There's something really special um, brewing here in Houston, and there's really." Uh, a community of folks working together to drive drive positive change for families and kids. Um, you know, Selena, I've got an opportunity to work and talk with your colleagues, Jackie, as well. I've been to the elementary campuses that you serve and seen your incredible work in action. Um, so this is just a, a privilege to get to to join the conversation today. Um, so again, my name is Courtney Isaac. I work for Good Reason Houston, and we're we're newer kids on the block, uh, so we are just a few few years old. But we're a nonprofit organization that's fiercely committed to improving public school education across the city of Houston. Uh, like everybody on this call who you've, you've heard from so far, we exist to make sure that every child in Houston, no matter their zip code, their race, their background, has access to an incredible public school education right in their right in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We believe that every kid, no matter where they live, should be able to walk to a world-class public school. And specifically, Good Reason Houston does that by supporting districts and charter networks on school quality, school creation, and talent initiatives. 
So looking forward to digging into some of these topics today. Awesome. Thank you, Courtney. Um, I think what never ceases to amaze me is the caliber of talent and energy of the people who are working in education, um, whether it is because you know, they are working on the public school side or they're working from a place of a deep desire for there to be equity and excellence across the board for all kids. That core belief that that is possible is, is the driving force. So thank you all for the work that you are doing and for the people who are joining on this call, just to learn a little bit more about how you can dig in and, and what things you need answered so that you can operate from an informed place. Um, so I'm gonna jump in with the first question. For someone who is outside of education, like all we really know is kind of what we read in the paper, just on the on the on the, on the cursory level. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see as happening in Houston in, around education? Like, if you had to say, like, here's what we are seeing in the work um, for kids in light of the pandemic, in light of what was happening before the pandemic, like, what are just some things that you are noticing from your vantage point? Um, that are impacting how kids are served in schools. Before you answer that question, a few ground rules for this. So this is not one of those panels where you get like brownie points for talking, right? Like you do, this is, this is, this is conversation. <laughs> this is, oh, I have a really, like, I have a real thought about that. We're just chit chatting, right? So like, we're only here for an hour and I would love to open it up at the end for a few questions. So it's conversational. We're not gonna like pass the mic and everybody answers every question. This is just like, you know, conversation among friends. So the question then is like, what are you seeing in terms of trends in education that may not be making the headlines or that may be making the headlines that you have a, a, an interesting insight on? I'll start us off. <laughs> um, so, in the work that we do, I think one of the biggest challenges right now um, that we are seeing that schools are really faced with having to address those non-academic needs of students um, during these unprecedented times. You know, it just seems like Texas, really in particular, man, we just cannot catch a break. We are being re-traumatized after having to gone through like disaster after disaster on top of a pandemic, right? So we've seen these effects that it's had on student enrollment right here in, um, in our local schools. Um, there's been an increase in basic needs and, and mental health support. So a recent example of this is that we saw a 262% increase uh, in referrals right after winter storm Uri. So um, in particular, there was uh, an increase in, in hunger and housing and even hygiene. So those are our, those basic needs. And so really our public school systems have become the de facto welfare state, you know, where schools are expected to not only meet those academic expectations, but also address those students for those non-academic needs. And so, um, you know, schools are really having to do more with less funding. Um, I think a recent example, and someone can fact check me, at, uh, but the last week that I saw what our state has yet to to, you know, release those federal stimulus funding, you know, intended for publication. Um, and so those are real dollars that I know is crucially needed right now um, in education. So I would say that is uh, one of the biggest challenges that we're facing. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more. And we just had a conver I just had a conversation with another group of women last night. I lead a Bible study on Zoom. And I'm not sure how this pertained to our lesson, but it did that schools are really increasingly um, tasked with providing those things that, that you just talked about, Selena. And it's, um, it's such a heavy lift and they need, so, they need so much support. And we're so grateful that we're able to support not just academically, but socially and emotionally and we do go outside of our lane and do some other things too. Sometimes when a principal brings us a specific need, but um, I, I don't think this is a new trend. Honestly, I've seen it for at really for the last 10 to 15 years, for sure. Um, where school is kind of the hub, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, it's the hub and it's the place where um, a lot of resources could be, 
you know, um, gathered and then and then distributed or, you know, whether it's counseling services or all kinds of things. And I don't think that's going to change, but I think we need to, I don't think that the general public understands that. And it's something that I think as nonprofits and just as people who really care about public education, that we need to educate the general public, like the majority of our our donors, individual donors, um, especially the high end donors. I mean, they, their kids don't go to public school. They don't. They don't even really realize until we take them on a site visit. You know what all is being dealt with. You know at school, and so I think education of the public of what is really going on in the schools and all that they are tasked to do now is really critical. Um, so. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to, to think about, you know, we're all aware that we're in a dire situation right now. It's true across the nation. It's absolutely true in, in Houston as well. Um, but I think all this, all of us on this call as well are aware that Houston was in a dire situation before the pandemic. And this was disproportionately impacting yeah. black, Latino and economically disadvantaged students. Mm -hmm. um, so just to paint a picture of that, there are about half a million students in Houston proper. I'm not just talking HISD, but all of the, all of the um, public schools in the limit of Houston. And of that about half of a million over 50% of those students every day are walking into a school that's ranked C, D, or F by the state. And that's just, that's an unacceptable reality. Um, what, what makes these numbers even worse and cringier is that Black students are four times as likely to attend a D or F rated school in Houston compared to their white peers. Um, and 80% of those students are considered economically disadvantaged. And so we really do see this as a, a, an, an equity issue that's really deepening with the pandemic. Um, Selena and Jackie touched on school is not just a place for learning and, and that's been and cut short, but there's just so many different factors working against students everywhere. Um, lack of access to internet. Is the curriculum ready to be digitized and available immediately? Um, access to free and reduced lunch, et cetera. So, you know, we really were in a dire state with the pandemic and we were starting from a, from a position of, of really needing to see improvement and growth in Houston schools. And I think, it, I think, Courtney, it's interesting to note that the, the stats you pulled of like 50% of Houston students attending C, D, or F schools was pre-pandemic. Like that yeah. data was not a result of our current, you know, climate and standing. Right. Um, there was recently a study done by McKinsey where mm -hmm. they were talking about the potential impact of a learning loss from, being, from kids being out of school for six months or people having limited access or varying degrees of access to a quality education being more significant and impacting that same demographic, that same population of children mm -hmm. um, that was already attending CD and F rated schools. Yeah. Um, I think as, as someone who grew up in Houston and you know attended, I was a magnet kid, right? Like I was magnet tested into all of the schools and then went to private school for high school. And then being on the other side of things and attending public schools, you really do not have a clear sense of the difference in the caliber of education until you see it or mm -hmm. come in contact with someone who can say, you know, you've got books in your classroom, you've got, you know, smart boards and you have, you know, all of the all of the resources you need to get the education that you know is going to propel your child for a future of opportunity and choice and then you walk into a different building and there are no books and there are no resources um, and some of the things that you are hearing in this conversation so around that's the academic portion 
-hmm. Right now we're dealing with like an academic deficit as well as, um, Selena, I think you nailed it, like the hunger, hygiene and housing, like the mm -hmm. things that the kids are carrying into schools with them that teachers and schools are now having to figure out how do we help our kids even be ready to receive learning? Mm -hmm. so, and, I mean, it's, it, I think it's really easy to listen to this and go, well, what are we supposed to do? Like we are, like, where can we lean in? I'd love to hear what, what things you're seeing that might be giving you some hope. Like what's, what's working in some of this context so we can realize that it's, it's not all doom and gloom. There's work to be done, but what are some things that you're seeing that, that are getting results or that are leading you to believe that things can be different and better? Courtney, I'm gonna have you start. Okay. I love that you say that it's it's not all doom and gloom. We've got some really smart, passionate people working towards this this challenge every day and waking up and thinking about how can reality be different for Houston kids. Um, so I'm gonna explain the solution, but first at first a little bit more color on the on the challenge. One specific challenge of uh, the pandemic connected to learning loss has been in math. Um, so as a former math teacher myself, math really builds on the previous year. Mm -hmm. Any of y'all, as students, you know that, as parents, you know that. But, you know, take, for example, if a child doesn't grasp, you know, what makes a part and a whole in a fraction in a third grade, then in fourth grade, they're going to have trouble adding together like fractions. In fifth grade, they're going to have trouble adding together fractions with different denominators, etc. cetera. Um, you know, and last year, this time, many of the schools who's uh, in Houston weren't, weren't, didn't have the resources and the, to really continue learning as it needed to be continued throughout the rest of the school year. And that, that started this beginning of learning, learning loss here. Um, so this is something that every single school district, if you talk to them, and it's not just math, um, but this is one example, but they're thinking about how do we start recovering um, learning loss in, in math? And that takes bold action. Um, I wanna highlight Aldine ISD here. They, um, this past year, they've had a math task force to really set a more rigorous vision for math instruction for the district that takes into context what's happened in the pandemic. And they've decided to implement a stronger curriculum that they are going to roll out district-wide starting next year. And we really need superintendents and, you know, boards who are willing to take bold action like that and say, hey, we actually need to raise the bar, put the right content in front of kids. Um, and one of those ways is by thinking through curriculum in a different, um, it, through a different lens. So I'm really excited to see that work uh, move forward in Alding. And Selena, I think what you all are doing at Pro Unitas is actually like addressing some of the other parts. And I know that that mm -hmm. part of what Pro Unitas does is it gives districts the tools to match kids with the other needs, right? So like, what, are there trends that you were seeing that like this works and that it's having a positive impact on kids? What are you seeing um, in your work? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that we'll start with, there have been conversations, right? There have been conversations about implementing wraparound services, um, really supporting that whole child that from that holistic view. Um, and we have seen that example right here in HISD where they, um, HISD is focusing on the holistic care um, and then has formed a whole wraparound department, right? Um, however, you know, locally and, and nationally, uh, I think we still have a long way to go in the conversation, but at least it started and, and we're, we're seeing some, uh, some acknowledgement and action around identifying and taking really, um, you know, I think as an educational system, we're usually focused on outputs and high stakes testing. So really thinking about those inputs, um, before, you know, before uh, in tandem, right? Like that's, you know, inputs are important um, as well as academic success. So 
that, that's what I've been seeing um, around, um, you know, we work with uh, several districts and so they've, they've started to uh, identify, you know, wraparound, um, whether they have a wraparound department or not, but focusing on the whole child is, is what I've seen. Awesome. Jackie, anything to add around that, what you're saying? Um, I think the only thing I would really have to add, and I don't know that it's a trend, but it's we've seen it, particularly this past year with the pandemic, we've always been very engaged with parents because we've always felt that was really critical, but it's almost like you had to double, triple those efforts, especially for our students that still remained online. Um, and parents just need a lot of and of support they want so much to help their child but sometimes they don't have the skills the knowledge the materials whatever and they're really struggling as well and so um, I hope um, that that's something that maybe was brought to light more this year and that people will organizations the schools whatever will can will really continue in that support of parents more to help their child and bring them along as partners in their child's education because that's that's something that we feel is really important and we do but um that's kind of a whole additional layer of things you know you know i think i think one of the the benefits is that we're having these conversations right like it, before, I think we were pretty just kind of comfortable in our lanes and kind of doing what we were doing. And mm -hmm. I think now, after having our children at home for several months and mm -hmm. seeing just how much went into educating our kids, and for some of us with the best resources, like the access to even like, you know, remarkable schools, still had to really dig in and realizing like, oh my goodness, this is, this is a lot of work. And there are some kids who are not getting a fraction of this. And I think it's prompted a lot of conversation from people in the community in particular who are not educators, who are wanting to, to dig in and to, to lean in and see how they can make an impact in the work moving forward. Um, so I think like having these conversations and having the issue be front and center again um, is, is, you know, while we, don't like that it took a pandemic to to bring our attention to this thing. I think we're in a place now where we can in, like leverage that experience to do something more meaningful. Mm -hmm. So in that vein, the question would then be, if there was one thing that you could, oh my goodness, stand on a mountaintop and, and have all of the people in Houston internalize about y'all, I'm from Houston, Texas, right? I, I say y'all, y'all, if we could just do this one thing, if we could aim our energy and efforts to addressing just this one slice, we could have monumental impact. What would you, I know I'm asking you to solve the world's problems. <laughs> I know, but I'm just curious. Like I want people to hear that there may be something that they can do like now, right? You don't, you don't have to wait until you have this much money or you have this much of whatever. What is something you want people to know that they can take action on to begin doing the work to help in education? I'll, I'll start. I mean, I'm going to harp again on parents that that there is so much that from day one that a baby is born that parents any level of education parent, you know, it doesn't matter if they have high literacy levels themselves. There's so much that they could do to um, build that child's vocabulary, develop their language skills, all the things so that when they get to pre-K or kinder, whichever one, they'll be ready and they won't be starting off behind. And really when we are able to do that with, parents that we serve, I mean, the pride and confidence that they have, because a lot of them don't, a lot of our parents don't feel like they have anything to offer, but that's so wrong. And I, I, I have a little, I've been having this vision for several years about starting out somehow, like when 
when a woman has a baby in the hospital that why don't we start there? I think when people know, have information and then they have some tools and support, there's just no limit to what, you know, a, a mother wants for her child or her children. There's just no limit for it. And so if, if she knew um, things that she could do and that she had some support to help her from day one, I just think that would set this the trajectory of a child's life and and and, and change the whole family dynamic, right? So that's my that's my vision of what we should what we should be doing, and I think we can do that. I'm struggling to cut my list down to one, to one Aisha. Yeah, um, it's a hard thing for it's one. A very, that's a very hard question. Um, so I may try to cheat and, and slip in one and a half. Um, you know, we talked about this need for learning recovery. Different students are going to need different supports. School districts will need to take on bold action, but there's going to be a deeper need more than ever for individualized supports. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard from three districts in the last two weeks about how can we get more tutors? Um, how can we set up more rigorous tutoring programs? I think things like summer school and after school tutoring and school tutoring are going to be really critical for schools next year. And I think that's, you know, people in our networks who are looking at ways, you know, to give back, that's, there's gonna be an opportunity there for you to show up to your neighborhood schools and perhaps provide some tutoring. So I would say, I, every, every call that I'm on with districts, they're talking about this. And so keep your eyes and ears open uh, for that, for that opportunity. I have to plug is my point five. Uh, I have to, I've got my little cute background. I have to shout out teachers for the absolutely heroic effort that they have been putting in this last year and a half. They are truly the frontline workers during this pandemic. So one thing you can do right now, next week is teacher appreciation week. Write those, you know, have your kiddos write their teachers thank you notes. Um, I'll put in the in the chat a link to our Houston Loves Teachers events just to continuously shout out teachers. We really need to make them feel loved. This has been for many of them, if if not most of them, the hardest year of their careers as teachers. Mm -hmm. We want them to come back to keep fighting to know that they're valued in this community, and you all can help us um, really celebrate them not just during teacher appreciation week, but ongoing. I think those are all really great um, calls to action. Um, yeah, literacy and, and teacher appreciation week. So I, those are, I'm gonna be sending out uh, my teacher appreciation, even though I still have friends and colleagues. So that'll be something I'll be, I'll be doing. Thank you for that reminder, Courtney. Um, but I think that from our lens, um, you know, what is something, uh, you know, the community can do today, um, to be honest, I, I think if we could bring or make caring cool again, I hate to <laughs> say that, but can we bring back carry, uh, caring to be cool again? I think that would solve a lot of our problems. You know, We have really increasingly become disconnected from one another. Um, I think, especially during this last year. Um, so if we could find opportunities to connect, that's when we really build community. So, and if you know your community, then you can know how to support them. Just even asking a simple question to someone like, hey, how was your day? You find out so much information when you start that conversation. That's a little starter, right? You become intimate and you build uh, those, that, that connection and that community. And so what if you're talking to a student and you find something um, that concerns you or that you didn't know before? What, what do you do with that information? And so um, here's where I would say, uh, living here uh, in the greater Houston area, you could submit a SAF, that is our student assistance form, 
are known as like our referral form that really notifies the school of the information that you want to share. Um, and if you wanted to take action today uh, to know more about your community, I would say head to the HISD needs map. It's this really cool interactive map where you can find out what students' needs are broken down by state representatives, your school board trustee, what's your neighborhood looking like, um, broken down by staff needs. And so it's where you can really kind of gather information and just become aware. Uh, and that could be a conversation starter. So yeah, that's where I would kind of say where we could, uh, what, what the community can, can do. Um, let's bring back Karen. I love that. And you should know that I'm going to quote you and yeah. it's, it's going to be somewhere on my LinkedIn with the screenshot whenever we do that. Um, and I think it, the thing that always comes back for me is to remember that they are all our children. Mm -hmm. like, like the, they, they are yours, they are mine. And I may have only given birth to two of them, but they all belong to all of us. Yes. Um, because one day they're gonna grow up and they're gonna be your kids' friends or they're gonna be your kids' neighbors. Mm -hmm. And if we want to send better humans out into the world, we've just got to treat them like they are all ours. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the first thing. It's like the mindset shift of like, if we're gonna engage in this work, why? Because they all belong to all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think Courtney, you are spot on in terms of teacher appreciation. Um, as someone who taught, and my husband is also a former teacher, whoa, can't even imagine having to be a teacher in this time, um, knowing that kids bring all of their, all of themselves into those classrooms. And as teachers, our job is to see them and to value them and to hear them and to create space for them. And in a world where it's pretty tough being an adult, to have to hold your stuff together enough to be also a teacher mm -hmm. is just, it's, it, there's some real work that's involved in that. Um, I would love to, I realize that like we have our, our set list of questions, but you may have walked into this space with your own curiosities, your own things that you were wondering about what school looks like, how is it different from what your children are experiencing, or maybe you don't have children and you are just, trying to make cool and care, cool, care and cool again. See, it's just, I gotta work on that. I'm gonna get it right, Selena, I promise. Um, but I'd love to, to open the floor for a couple of questions. Um, what, are you, what, are you, what are your wonderings about what's happening in education in Houston? Um, any questions from, from you all? I have a, a question. Um, I have lots of questions, but um, and all of this has been so amazing. And I too will um, quote you, Selena, on your um, so look out on LinkedIn. Um, what do you see? So I know the trends for next year. Courtney mentioned, you know, tutoring being critical. Are there other fundamental shifts that you have seen happen as a result of the pandemic or throughout this period that you think will continue? Um, that are positive, right? I mean, there's there's a lot of trauma and things that have to, to change, but have you seen other positive changes as a result of this that you think are going to continue beyond um, where we are right now? As you say, I have thoughts and I, I'll jump, I'm okay. technically just moderating, but I, since I, I'm i not one to keep my opinions to myself. So welcome. Um, I think one of the trends that we are seeing is the cross collaboration around nonprofits. So mm -hmm. I think, whereas we've always known that that was something that we needed to do, I think now we are saying, wait, Good Reason Houston, in partnership with Pro Unitas, in partnership with Teach for America, in partnership with One Goal, mm -hmm. we can all kind of wrap our arms together around a district. Mm -hmm. um, and I think districts are realizing that they can't do it all. And so that they're more open to that kind of collaboration than I think they've traditionally been. Um, I think that'll be one of the lasting benefits. And I think that our even our foundation partners, like our funding partners are trying to encourage that type of collaboration because the reality is it's like schools cannot be everything to all children. 
And unfortunately, that's what the expectation is now. Like we're expecting schools to be counseling services, housing, you know, academic houses. Like we are really expecting schools to do all of the things. Um, and I think we're realizing slowly that that, if you, uh, what is it? Uh, what is it? The something master of none. Like that's kind of where we are. Whatever the saying is where you're trying to do all the things and you're not a master of any one of them because you're trying to do all of the things. Um, I think we're realizing that, that we cannot serve children well in that way. And so I think one of the lasting benefits is multiple organizations scrubbing in together and kind of leaving ego out of it at the, at the service of kids. Mm -hmm. Can, can I add to that, Aisha? I love that you brought this up. Like this is like huge. Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head, Aisha, on this. So in terms of like what is, you know, uh, what we could be seeing. I think we are in a prime opportunity right now. You hit the nail on the head by saying like, schools cannot support students alone. Really, we can't. Um, schools are great, you know, service sites. However, they are not to be service providers. And I always like to say what our CEO is notorious for saying, I'm gonna quote him. And he says that we are program rich and system poor. Houston really has over 600 nonprofits reported by the Greater Houston Community Foundation, and that number is only taking into account those nonprofits that, you know, opted in. There are 1.6 million nonprofits right here across the United States. Did those kind of numbers, like, surprise you? So, you, like, there are tons of nonprofits, and so, yeah, using this opportunity, um, ways for nonprofits to uh, talk with districts and district resources so that they can be maximized you know um, we have we have a plethora here um, and so I think that that could be a positive uh, opportunity to find out, you know, how do we find out what resources currently exist? Mm -hmm. How do students connect to them? How do we term determine which ones have access to these services? Who are we leaving out unintentionally? You know, these are all the types of questions um, that we can ask. And, and I think it's prime right now uh, to find those. And as you already said, they're, they're in talks. We're talking to uh, in, in collaboration as it should be. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things that came to mind for me, you know, one is more connected to family engagement. Mm -hmm. So last um, spring when the pandemic, uh, you know, really started here in the U.S., that was real. we saw a shift in a lot of our public schools. And, and certainly there were a lot of principals and teachers who already had this practice, but it was necessary system-wide, district-wide for schools and school districts to be calling home and seeing, are you safe? Do you have access to internet? You know, without schools free and reduced lunch, do you have access to a warm meal? Um, and some of just those basic, uh, basic needs. And so that's something that uh, I really believe will continue just the, and of course, there were several teachers and principals who are already doing things like that, but really checking in with families and, you know, doing home visits and making sure that your community is safe and okay. It's, it's, a, it's a balance, like what is the, the role of the school, but I do hope that um, more direct communication is something that continues. Um, I think in the in the instructional side of the house, this year has been so hard, but there's been some positive things that have come out of the models that schools have been forced into. So, you know, these, these virtual at home models, we, we are gonna see school sites and digging into blended learning. So that means some of the learning happens on the computer, some happens in person, some of it happens in home on the computer beforehand, et cetera. But we are, you know, gonna codify the best of the best practices from the pandemic, from virtual learning and make sure that we're building off of that. I think across the city, you're gonna see 
Um, some superintendents look to incorporate some of these practices probably into a subset of their schools to keep learning and growing before they scale them larger. But that's something that's definitely positive that we're going to learn and grow from. Thanks for asking, Jessica. I wanna make sure we like have space for maybe like one or two questions if, if there are any outstanding. Hello, can I ask you a question? Yeah, go for it. So I'm curious um, for any of you who have um, personal knowledge or just have read about how does Houston or Texas compare to other states? Um, you know, I'm, one of you just talked about the 600 nonprofits that are trying to, uh, you know, provide uh, support to a system that is very weak. And um, I've lived in Houston for a long time, but I didn't grow up here. And I always am disappointed by my perceived, um, my perception that this, this state is falling very far, far short of what it could be doing to provide um, a robust public education option for kids. Um, and so our nonprofits here asked to do more than they are either in other cities or in other states. I, I think I, I, was, I was sitting in a conversation with some other, we were having an education nerd talk, no joke. We were sitting outside at somebody's home, having beverages and talking education. Um, and one of the people in that conversation was saying how the perception is that education in Texas and in Houston specifically gets really caught up in politics. Like, mm -hmm. so we, we don't, we don't always have the financial support. And I think Selena mentioned the, the federal funds that had been allocated for the district have not yet been dispersed to the district. Um, and so there, there's definitely some politics at play in that. Um, and I think that does make the lift heavy for all parties involved, right? Like when, when one leg of the chair isn't doing its job, the other three legs have to work harder to, to, to kind of maintain the balance. Um, I think that's part of the challenge. Um, I don't know, I mean, I'm not in the system. I imagine Courtney, you might have some thoughts on that or just given good reason Houston. And even thinking about like, I think about Dallas and Dallas seems to have a more comprehensive approach towards public education. Courtney, you came from Dallas. I think that's part of why I was wondering if that rang true for you. Yeah, well, I think one of the, so I, my career in education after becoming a teacher really has focused on educator talent and started with teacher talent. And that's something I obsess about every day on the job. And so I think it's really about like I said, we've got a lot of brilliant people here in Houston, but it's really about cultivating um, a large talent pool to impact, you know, the 1 million students um, that were, or excuse me, half a million students that we're talking about in, in Houston proper. So that's something that I'm, that I definitely think about. And when I compare um, the two, you know, we need more people going into the teaching profession. And that's true across the nation, but it is especially true uh, here in Houston. I will say as a bright spot, I do, Selena, you said you said to fact check you. So just yesterday, the state did release the guidelines on the funding. Yes. Um, and so two thirds of the funds are going to be um, available for, um, for districts, which is, you know, we're potentially talking about Houston ISD drawing down 800 million in funding um, from uh, from these funds. So we, this has, all, districts have been on edge about this because we are one of the last groups to be able to draw this down. And so we're talking when when I've been talking with districts about, hey, are you going to take on this bold action? Are you equipped to do this? You know, one of the the biggest reasons why they're hesitant is because of the funding. So I'm now, now that this is secured, I'm looking forward to um, hearing how this will impact their plans over the next two years. Yeah. 
I, I was going to say that I hadn't I hadn't found a good spot to say it. I'm like, but I read yesterday in the Chronicle that that's happening. So I was very excited. And that 800 million, if I remember the article right, is like 40 percent. Yeah, it's huge. Of HISD's budget, so it's pro, you know it's divvied out according to Title One. So if mm -hmm. you're in a different school district, you know you're not going to get as much. But still, it's amazing. It's but we'll see what they do with the money. That's that's the key. Because we know money doesn't solve everything. Like no, we, it doesn't. We, it doesn't. We, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the how strategic can you be in drawing a straight line to what you do with the money to impact and results yes. for kids is, is the real measure yes. of, of success. One respect. thing I'm encouraged by with that is there is a grant from the TEA, the Texas Education Agency right now um, called the Resilient School Support Program. And I think three area districts uh, applied to that and, uh, and received that grant. And so they're going to be getting uh, consulting support to really think through um, these next couple of years, budget allocation approach and really like create a task force around this. Um, and so there's gonna be a lot of learning across districts. And that's something I'm really thinking about is how do we continue to convene and connect on the learning um that different districts are, are are gathering at this time that's a great point i think about like some of the charter superintendents and the traditional isd superintendents having conversation to share um, best practices and mm -hmm. learning really in support of students across the city um, has some great potential to be able to learn what's allowed some of the charters to retain some of their students during this time, mm -hmm. um, to learn from Dr. Goffney and Aldine, who's making some great strides in her district, to share that learning across districts, um, has the potential to, to have an enormous impact as well. Absolutely. I think maybe, maybe one more question. Nobody likes the pressure of asking the last question because you feel like it has to be a really great question. So feel free to ask just some, you know, make it good, but it doesn't have to be great or perfect. I want to ask really uh, what I think will probably be a quick question. So if someone wants to think about their question and toss it out there, you, you've, you've all mentioned various, you know, pieces of information that you hear and read. Are there any good local sources that you would recommend aside from the Chronicle? I know they have a dedicated education reporter that does a good job of following what's going on. Are there other, any other local resources that you would suggest for those of us that want to, you know, stay up to date on what's going on? I got to plug um, our newsletter. Uh, so if you go to goodreasonhouston.org and sign up to learn more, you will get information that way. I think it's important to say that we you know, as, aspire to work with all the local school districts and uh, and different folks and organizations um, in Houston doing the work. So um, follow follow us. I do think we are lucky to have you know the Chronicle uh, that is such a uh, consistent uh, education uh, resource. But Selena and Jackie, Aisha, any other resources come to mind besides? I I was like looking at my phone because there's an email, like a, a newsletter that I just subscribed to. And I was like, what is the name of it? Um, it's not local to Houston specifically, but it is a Texas newsletter mm -hmm. that I think does a really great job of weaving in context, research, data, and the implications in education. And it's Texas 2036. Thank you. Courtney, I was actually going to say, I was actually going to suggest y'all um, Thanks. I, I was, <laughs> and um, I think that on a kind of a little bit differently, but children at risk, you know, mm -hmm. like you're really researchy, you know, yeah. um, they've got, I mean, they've got a lot of stuff. <laughs> okay. yeah. I think those are the two. Well, I appreciate your attentiveness. If somebody has a parting question, we would love to take it. I know that we want to get a group picture before we sign off. 
so we can tell all the people that that people actually do come together and talk about education. Um, so I'm gonna, yeah, if you wouldn't mind turning on your camera or you can leave your name up, it's totally fine. Whatever's on the screen when we do the countdown is what we'll see. So people will know that you were here and it's totally okay if you're like, my hair looks crazy and I'm just not gonna do it. That's totally fine too. <laughs> I'm not camera ready today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, great. I wanna take a picture, right? Okay, thank you all. Awesome, awesome. Um, and Kristen, how can we get that photo? I will, uh, I can send it out to the group and we'll also post it on our uh, social media accounts. Okay. Yeah, so I'll make sure you have it. Well, thank you all for being here today. Uh, what a fantastic kickoff to the series. Um, and just really enjoyed hearing from all of you. And um, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. And uh, it's good to hear, you know, what's uh, what the underlying issues are. And I appreciate that we were also able to hear a little bit about, you know, the things that we, we know that are working and the things that we can look forward to. So thank you so much for being here and um, have a good day. Thanks for Bye. doing it. And for having Katie. us. Bye. Thank you all so much. Bye. Bye.